Okay, everybody. So today we're going to start learning about worms. Um, there's three different phylum that we'll be concerned about or concerned with during our class the flatworms, the roundworms, and the segmented worms. Um, today I'm just going to start with a general overview, um, and flatworms will be the first of the three phyla that we get into. And check out these lovely photos. Um, this middle photo, by the way, is uh, something called a tapeworm, which some of you have heard of before. They're kind of terrifying to me. Uh, so let's get going. Now, a lot of what I'm going to focus on is how worms are different than the previous groups of animals that we studied, which was the cnidarians. Um, the worms are very different from the radial symmetric cnidarians um, and the asymmetric peripherans or sponges that we studied. So remember, uh, remember radial symmetry is um, like the name sounds. Uh, usually the animal is circular in shape. And if you imaginarily cut it in half, you can cut it in half in many different directions and still get two equal halves that look similar or look the same. Asymmetric, remember anytime you add that letter A in the front of the science word, it means not or not. So an asymmetric animal does not have any kind of symmetry, which is true for sponges, which is periphera. Um, and as my memory serves me, I can't think of any other animals that are asymmetric besides sponges, so you're not gonna see that much anyway. Now, there are three separate phyla of worms, like I was saying in the beginning. First, there's the phylum Platyhelminthes, um, and this is the flatworms. Um, and we'll be focusing tomorrow uh, on the flatworms specifically. A lot of these guys are parasites, and parasites, depending on your opinion, depending on how you are, can be either really freaking cool or really terrifying. This picture right here is a type of flatworm called a tapeworm. There's also phylum nematoda. These are the roundworms. Um, and there's also a lot of parasites in this phylum, phylum nematoda. And then finally, and it's going to be a little while before we talk about these guys, the phylum Annelida, which is the segmented worm. And this is the phylum that a traditional earthworm lives in that you guys are all familiar with. So we're going to spend the next few days specifically on flatworms and roundworms. Now, as far as complexity, the uh, phylum platyhelminthes that we'll start off with is the simplest. Um, and we just got done talking about coelom. And phylum platyhelminthes uh, does not have a coelom. They do not have that body cavity. Then there's phylum nematoda, a little more complex. Uh, phylum platyhelminthes, we would say, are acelomates. They don't have a coelom. Phylum nematoda, we would say, are pseudocelomates. So you're starting to see that coelom but it's only partially lined with mesoderm tissue, like we were talking about last class. And then finally, phylum Annelida, which is the most complex. And those guys are true coelomates, uh, which all other animal groups, after we study about Annelida, will also be true coelomates. So they're considered the most complex of these three. So as I was saying, and I'm just putting it up here in writing, phylum platyum, platyum, platyum these contains the simplest worms, while the segmented worms in phylum Annelida are very complex in comparison. Um, but even though I'm saying they're simple, even the simplest flatworms, which is platyum these, um, are more complex than cnidarians, um, and also the sponges, the peripherans. So even though they'll seem pretty simple, and they are fairly simple, they still have some uh, developmental advantages over cnidarians and peripherans. Now, part of your exit ticket today is, is going to be to ask um, why worms are considered more advanced than cnidarians and peripherans. Um, and there's a lot of different reasons, so make sure that you pay attention to some of this, because this is how you'll answer your exit ticket. Now, worms in general have a long and slender body that allows the animal to move about more rapidly than the radial symmetric cnidarians. So remember cnidarians, like jellyfish, uh, they are capable of movement, um, but uh, their movement is more dictated by the ocean current, 
than it is by a conscious desire to go in one specific direction. Um, these guys can actually consciously choose which direction they're going to go into. Um, they can move forward in a single direction, whereas Cnidarians have to remain stationary like the sea anemones or drift along in currents like the jellyfish. Now, all of worms that we're going to study all are bilaterally symmetric. Um, and some people call that front end symmetry because uh, the sense organs are concentrated in the front end, the head of their body. So in bilateral symmetry, there are two equal halves of the body that mirror each other. Just like you and I, we are bilaterally symmetric. So if you imagine cutting us, you, me, right down the middle of our face through our nose, um, we would have two mirror images of each other. And that's the only direction that you can cut us in half and get those two mirror images is from top to bottom. It's vertically like that. And so when that happens, we consider an animal that you can only divide in two equal halves that mirror each other in one way. We call that a bilaterally symmetric animal. Most animals that you're familiar with are bilaterally symmetric. Now, all bilaterally symmetric animals have four body surfaces, and you learned this the first quarter, but I just want to review this with you really quickly. Okay, so here's a fish. A fish is bilaterally symmetric. Okay, and if we look at the front end of the body towards the head, we call that position um, or that body surface anterior. When we're talking about the back end of the animal, um, I think I told you first quarter, think but is posterior, that's the rear end of the body. Dorsal is the top surface near the back. So for you and I, that's our back. For this fish, it's that top layer. And then finally is ventral. Uh, for you and I, that's our uh, belly. Uh, for this fish, it's its belly as well. It's the lower surface or the underside. So those are the four body surfaces that all bilaterally symmetric animals have. And remember, we'll use those terms throughout this class um, to describe things. Now, we saw a video on this last class. Uh, this is a planarian. This is that amazing animal that has crazy regeneration properties. Um, and it's a flatworm, so it's the simplest of these three phyla of worms that we're getting ready to study. Uh, now, one characteristic that all worms have, all three phyla, is that the mouth, the sense organs, the brain are located at the front end of the animal. That's something called cephalization, and uh, I'll give you that vocabulary word uh, a little later. I'm not worried about it today. This allows the worm to locate food and to respond to stimuli as they move because they have all of those sense organs concentrated in one spot and so they can kind of move that head from side to side and around and uh, get a really good idea of where a stimuli is or to locate food. Now, worm embryology includes all three germ layers. So even though flatworms are um, acelomates, they still have all three germ layers. That's an advantage over cnidarians. And just as a reminder, those germ layers are endoderm, which is inside layer, the ectoderm, the outside layer, and the mesoderm, the middle layer. Uh, peripherans, so sponges and cnidarians, develop from only two, or in the case of peripheran, one germ layer. And that's it for today's introduction. Uh, so remember, you can pause this video, you can rewind it, um, but make sure you get your notes on it in your notebook. Um, you already have the notes in your notebook if you need to uh, access those. And then also on today's agenda, I have a Microsoft Word document. So if you're having a problem with the notebook, you can use that Microsoft Word document. And if none of that works, you can do old school and you can write notes on paper and you can take a photo of that and submit that to your notebook. But one way or another, whether it's the Word file, doing it directly in your notebook or handwriting it and take a picture, you still do need a copy of this in your notebook. All right, talk to you in a bit.